I missed the, the talk of my predecessor, the title of which was a little bit discouraging, everything you want to know about inflation. So I said, well, either he grossly underestimates the intellectual curiosity of this forum or he overestimates the speed at which he can compress knowledge within 30 minutes. <laughs> so my, my talk now is, is based on the hypothesis that he did not manage to talk too fast within 30 minutes. And we'll talk about the culture of inflation. It's a subject uh, of great interest that has the importance of which has been realized as from the 19th century. So if we read important um, 19th century economic uh, uh, monetary theorists such as William Goode or uh, Charles Holt, uh, so they, they always come in and say yes, uh, these inflationary practices uh, have even uh, important cultural uh, impact on society, so uh, uh, consequences that do not uh, concern prices and the organization uh, of, of markets and so on, but uh, reverberate more generally on the behavior of the population. But then they didn't elaborate really very much. And uh, astonishingly, in the 20th century, uh, few economists have tackled the, the subject. Many have said, yes, it's an important subject, but we won't even start going into this. So I wrote a little uh, chapter in my book, The Ethics of Money Production, which was uh, first published uh, in German in 2007 and then uh, the uh, English manuscript in 2008 and added another chapter with some new stuff on the ethics, on, uh, on the cultural consequences of inflation in my German language book, Krise der Inflationskultur, which hopefully will appear uh, maybe next year in an English translation. The translation is already there, but I was uh, too lazy or did not have uh, time to, uh, to, to turn it into the final manuscript. So we uh, have uh, the culture of deflation. Maybe it's useful to start with a few definitions. You will forgive me, I'm a, I'm a professor, so it's a professional bias, right? So I'd like to say a few words about what we mean by culture and what I mean by inflation. So uh, culture, I would define quite generally as uh, the totality of the way we do things, the way we think, uh, the way we talk, the way we behave, the way we go about different things that are essential for human life, the way we dress, uh, different ways to dress, uh, different ways to eat, different things you can eat. Uh, what we consider to be problematic, how we go about solving problems and, and so on, uh, different ways of doing this and this, the totality of which reflects uh, culture. I cannot say that the way Europeans dress or traditionally have dressed is in somewhat, uh, some respects superior to the traditional Turkish way of dressing or Arab way of dressing, but it's just a different way of doing it. So um, in economic analysis, what can we say about, about culture? Uh, of course, we can could develop a theory of the production of culture. Nobody has done this so far, as, uh, to my knowledge, from an economic point of view. But what I'm mostly interested in uh, are the cultural differences that result from government interventions. And these can be explained in a comparative way. Right? So we can uh, compare the changes in behavior and the change, changes in attitude that result from interventionism as compared to behavior, attitudes, and so on that would exist without those interventions. Right, so you have some dispositions that exist anyway. Right, so people are more or less, uh, more or less strong time preference, for example. In government interventionisms, uh, interventions not in all forms, but in most forms, tend to increase uh, the preference for the presence, so increase uh, 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 time preference. Inflation, a second term. Inflation in uh, mainstream economics is defined as a, a permanent or less permanent increase in, in the price level. Uh, in Austrian uh, circles, uh, this uh, definition is not considered to be particularly useful. I mean, you, as, as a definition, it's, it's impeccable, right? You can define the word in this way, and it's perfectly uh, meaningful. Uh, but Austrians prefer, as a rule, another definition, which uh, at the heart of which is the, the notion that um, there can be such thing as a politically induced increase of the money supply. Governments can intervene to increase the money supply uh, to a level that is higher than the level it would have reached otherwise. Right? So this is the starting point of the theory of monetary uh, interventions. Why do governments do this? Well, as a rule, because they themselves profit from this. Right? These are the famous Cantillon effects. And they uh, uh, justify uh, these interventions in terms of various theories uh, that we deal with at the universities, uh, in which they explain why such interventions are beneficial from an overall point of view. 
Now we will leave this out uh, in, uh, this afternoon in my talk at any rate. Uh, so I'm not concerned about the reasons why interventions might or not be beneficial from an overall point of view. So my point is simply that uh, if we want to talk meaningfully about inflation, the most suitable to go about this is to uh, understand this as a consequence of monetary interventions. So what I'm really talking about this afternoon uh, is the culture of monetary interventions. What kind of cultural difference or cultural impact do monetary interventions have? Now, there are uh, actually a great number of different uh, consequences, and I'm not yet quite sure what the most suitable way to classify those uh, would be. Uh, in my books, I just uh, uh, listed them, so it's more of a bullet point list, right? Different sections within the chapter, seven, eight major points. And uh, today, I would like to uh, maybe uh, uh, propose three uh, major types of consequences. I wouldn't say this is a definite classification, but uh, one that could be uh, retained anyway. Uh, one uh, uh, concerns the consequences that, uh, that result from the fact that inflation always benefits a, cla a special class of beneficiaries. The second uh, group concerns uh, the culture of debt that results under certain circumstances from uh, uh, monetary interventions. And the third group concerns the moral or ethical standards that prevail uh, in society. So let's start with the first one. Uh, inflation always creates, uh, monetary interventions always create a special class of beneficiaries. Now that invariably is so because if you increase the money supply, then some people use these new money units first and therefore obtain a higher purchasing power, which necessarily goes at the expense of other people whose purchasing power is thereby diminished. I can buy more. I can bid higher prices for apartments and for nice suits and for vacations in uh, five-star hotels in Turkey and so on. And to the extent that I obtain the house, I can buy the or rent the apartment, I can buy the suit, I can rent the room in the five-star hotel, other people, uh, by logical necessity, are deprived of the same service. So it's a redistribution game. Now, the important point in monetary interventions is that, uh, as a rule, and I would say that this is more than a rule, it's almost a praxeological necessity, uh, the group of beneficiaries is known in advance and fairly stable across time. Now, it would be imaginable that we set up a monetary system to increase the money supply, and each year there's a different group of beneficiaries. So this year it's the bank, next year it's the shoe industry, the year after it's the members of the Property and Freedom Society, and so on and so on. Right? So it would be imaginable. But of course you start laughing, and for a good reason. Right? Uh, it's difficult to imagine that so much efforts uh, be undertaken in terms of justification of this uh, system, setting up the system as a whole organization, and so on, only so that the benefits then spread out randomly across society. Right? So the people who make this investment uh, and who, who justify and hide the, 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 the hidden costs and so on, of course, they, they want themselves to, to reap the benefits. So it's not surprising, really, that the benef beneficiaries, there's a hardcore of beneficiaries that does not, not really change much uh, across time. Now, who are these beneficiaries? Um, and here, we, if we look at the history of monetary institutions, because the beneficiaries uh, depend on the institutions that you set into place to execute the monetary interventions, we can distinguish roughly uh, before and after, so two periods before and after the 19th century. Before the 19th century, uh, very largely, monetary interventions concern intervention into a precious metal coin system. And so the money of, of different countries was precious metals, typically silver coins, to a, a smaller extent also gold coins. And the government intervened in the monetary system typically, typically by debasing the coinage. That is, it mixed um, uh, the coins with uh, uh, base uh, alloys of a lower value so as to profit, so as to pocket the difference. Uh, one uh, member of this uh, uh, meeting was so kind to give me actually three uh, coins or four coins from uh, Costa Rica. Who is with the gentleman? Could you? Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Could you uh, tell me your name again? Sebastian. Sebastian, yeah. What, what's the family name? Ortiz. 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 Okay, so that's, my, that's what my students will have to learn. Sebastian Ortiz, benefactor of 
economic students in Angers. Right. So he gave me coins of recent times, right, so with a nice silver coin from the mid-1970s, was a f pretty full-bodied silver coin, and then debasement, right, so the, the coin uh, becomes smaller, has a higher denomination, first it has a higher denomination, and then the same coin becomes smaller, right? So it's the typical debasement uh, uh, process, right, even still alive in those countries that have some uh, precious metal coinage. So this was, by and large, um, uh, the way things were handled until the end of the 18th century. And so the main beneficiaries were invariably those who were running the, the mint, uh, and which was typically in the hands of the government. Well, it was the, the king, the prince, and, and the democratically organized societies was well, the government that ran the mints. Now, as from the 19th century, an institution that has uh, started uh, to become uh, noticeable in the 17th century, namely banking, and especially, especially fractional reserve banking, so banks that produce money tickets, money representatives, based on uh, the uh, precious metal coinage, uh, be uh, became important and came to dominate the production of uh, money, now in the wider sense, including money substitutes, in all Western countries. A, I could show you, I, I didn't bring uh, the uh, my, my charts and so on, because that would have taken longer than to analyze the different movements. But it's, it's very clear if you look at the change of the composition of the money supply in Britain, in the United States, in Germany, and so on, in the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, it was pretty much based on uh, precious metal coins. Only England is an, is an exception. And then from there, it goes precious metal be, uh, uh, become less and less important. And then created money, so deposits, uh, checking deposits and bank notes become more and more important. Uh, as you know, and as it has been said by my distinguished predecessor, all of this was uh, uh, represented by a great pedagogical, or say we, uh, shall we say propagandistic, effort uh, on, the, uh, on the side of the governments as a great progress. Right? We have these new types of money, so necessarily it must be good. Right? It must be a uh, great innovation that benefits mankind. Anyway, my main point is the following. In this process, the creation of money no longer uh, uh, lay in the hands of the government. Now we have a distinct group from the government, a private group, that suddenly, just like the government itself, received an, an artificial source of revenue, a source of revenue that did not spring from typical uh, market activity, productive act activity. So you produce something, you sell it. You provide a service and you sell it and so on. You work for something and you sell it. So here we have a type of revenue that is created out of thin air, the ex nihilo creation of money, and provides revenue just to, to a group of people without corresponding services, just as the government by taxing the population or by using uh, the debasement process before, earned additional revenue that was not based on any services or any production. So this is noteworthy and is certainly a, a reason for the sudden popularity of uh, fractional reserve banks in the 19th century. Right? It, uh, because it, it became popular because everybody could become a banker. And in fact, we see uh, during the 19th century various sprouts of uh, uh, the creation of commercial banks that were created in the hundreds and in the thousands. Right. In the early uh, 19th century in the US, and then also in Britain, uh, and then later on, same thing in Germany, France, and so on. Right. Not in all periods, but for example, in France, it was during the Second uh, Empire, so 1850 to 1871, right, that the uh, banking business was liberalized, and pretty much everybody who wanted could set up a bank. Right. So people were enthusiastic, yes. Riches for everybody, right? Was, uh, uh, right? The banking profession was uh, a state-sponsored uh, profession just like uh, uh, lawyers and uh, medical doctors, and right? also were under the protection of the government and was by the, uh, the, the, the tr tr trinity, right? The much decried uh, trinity by, from, the, from a Marxist point of view, right? Of the new, uh, new uh, bourgeoisie that had usurped uh, the position of power of the former nobility. So we have a popular activity with uh, incomes out of nothing, special class of beneficiaries. And because of this uh, special class of income, it's not surprising that we have the um, slow emergence, not from one day to another, but the slow emergence of some sort of a shadow government. 
And as a, a, a further consequence, then the removal of ultimate decision making in politics from the political scene, from the visible political scene. Because then as a consequence of this new source of revenue that came into existence, which was in competition with tax revenue, right? Uh, it became more and more important for kings, princes, parliaments, and so on to have access to this funding. Right? And that was not discussed in the public forum. So we have a distinguishing feature of our own day. Right? So sometimes we have the, the impression, well, every four years, every five years, we can elect a new government, but uh, nothing, nothing really changes, and uh, the, the program that they announce is not put into practice and so on. All of this is a reflection of this uh, pro uh, process, certainly not, the on not only caused by this process, but also caused by this pro process. I come to the second group of consequences, the culture of debt. Uh, the age of fractional reserve banking that became, began in the 19th century uh, went uh, in hand with an increased fragility of the banking sector. Before the 19th century, banks were few in number and they, they tended to be well financed, that is, uh, they had relatively few debt and uh, uh, important uh, uh, treasuries, important uh, liquid means. Uh, then starting in the 19th century, as fractional reserve banking grew large, the banks reduced their um, uh, equity, that is, they went into more debt, and they uh, kept less cash on hand to satisfy redemption uh, demands. So they became more fragile, more vulnerable to shocks coming from their customers, and uh, at the same time, they also became more interdependent. And if one bank goes bankrupt, and it's typically in commercial relations with other banks, either directly uh, because they receive credit from other banks or indirectly through common customers. Uh, so uh, a bank that goes bankrupt entails the bankruptcy of other banks, especially if they are uh, not uh, well endowed with equity and so on. So with this fragility and this interdependence, we have the new phenomenon of banking crisis, which in fact is a phenomenon of the 19, which starts in the 19th century. Before the 19th century, we didn't have any systematic banking crisis. We had occasional banking crisis, seemingly rare unheard of events, right? There was a famous banking crisis in France in the 1710s. Uh, there was a, a monetary crisis in the US, right? The inflationary continentals and the revolutionary circumstances. So un, uh, exceptional uh, circumstances. As from uh, the 19th century, so starting after the, the Napoleonic Wars, banking crisis became a regular feature of uh, Western economic development. And it is a fruit of the fractional reserve banking system. Now, crisis uh, invariably entailed different sort of responses, and there are three uh, or four major categories of responses that we always uh, got. One was a uh, process of centralization, so banks either uh, merged to, with, to be able to be better withstand the crisis situation, or they were helped out by uh, centralized institutions like central banks. There was greater uh, dependence uh, between them and vis-a-vis -vis a central organization, and um, they were regulated to an ever greater extent right? because the, the, the government, in helping banks out, uh, felt uh, obliged, morally obliged, toward the population to justify uh, uh, this help. And so at the same time, they introduced uh, greater banking regulation. So we have a cultural feature of the uh, financial industry, which was always uh, very strongly regulated, or increasingly regulated so in the 19th century. Now, before uh, World War II, uh, this movement was limited to the financial sector. Right? So we have this movement of ever greater regulation, uh, ever greater socialization, if you wish, going in hand with ever greater uh, dependence vis-a-vis -vis a central institution and going in hand with ever greater fragility, but limited to one sector of the economy. So the real sector was not really concerned. Households were not really concerned. Governments were concerned to a, a stronger extent, but rather limited. Now, what happened after uh, World War II was that this type of behavior that we find in fractional reserve banking and the type of uh, consequences were generalized to the rest of the population. Why is this? It was a consequence of the fact that money production, so monetary interventions, were pushed to such a quantitative level 
that uh, a permanent increase of the price level resulted. Okay. Before World War II, roughly speaking, there were in the, in the 150 years or so before this, uh, the, the price level in the virtually all Western countries uh, had a shrinking tendency. It was a price deflationary movement. Now, if the price level shrinks, um, this uh, provides a very strong stumbling block against uh, uh, debt. And if you take out debt today and you know you have to pay the same sum, whatever, $1,000 or $100,000, uh, tomorrow or next week or next year, and you can expect that the price level will be lower than, than today, and so you have to pay back in a money that is more purchasing power than the money that you lend out today. Right. Um, things, so under such circumstances, there is no strong incentive for you uh, to go into debt. Quite to the contrary, you have a very strong material incentive to avoid debt as far as possible. It does not mean that companies might not go into debt because even though they have to pay back uh, money at a higher purchasing power, they might earn, thanks to the credit, much more money than before. But for a household, it's typically not the case. For a government, it's typically not the case. Right. So what happened after World War II is that money production was pushed to such a level that a permanent increase of, of the price level resulted in virtually all countries. Under such circumstances, it is worthwhile for people to go into debt. Right? You take out a credit today, if you can expect that the price level always increases in the future, you can expect your own revenue to increase, even if you do not become smarter uh, in the, the course of time. Of course, we all do become smarter in the course of time. But I think even if you don't, and you stay just as dumb as you are today, right? thanks to the general increase of the price level, it might uh, be a repercussion on your own revenue, which is likely to increase. Therefore, you will be in a better position to reimburse any credit that you've taken out in the past. So this kind of behavior then, uh, or this kind of incentive exists for all sectors. It exists for governments, and governments can anticipate that their future tax revenue will be higher than today. So they can take out more credits in the belief that um, well, uh, their tax revenue will be higher tomorrow, so they can pay all this credit back. Plus, they know, of course, that also the central bank is behind them. Uh, households have the same incentives. Right? We can expect our revenue to increase, therefore we have a strong incentive to go into debt. Uh, therefore, young households, as soon as there's any permanent income in the family, take out a credit, buy a house, buy an apartment, right? and then pay back uh, the, the, the debt at uh, ever less pain because their revenue increases. And firms uh, do the same thing for the same uh, reasons. Right? So we get uh, the phenomenon of, of the financialization of the economy. The non-financial uh, agents behave increasingly just like banks. Right? What does a household do that takes out a credit in order to buy a, a house? Right? In financial language, that would be called a leverage. Right? The household leverages right, its own current spending thanks to credit. Right? It's a financial behavior. Uh, firms do the same thing. And firms, uh, especially in America, a little less so than in Europe, they did uh, another thing, especially in the past 30 years, they um, invested an ever greater share of their um, uh, capital in financial assets. So if you look at the balance sheets of US uh, non-financial companies, you will see that uh, in the case of corporations, uh, about 40% of the capital today is invested in uh, financial assets and not in equipment, uh, machinery, uh, and so on, right? uh, vehicles. It's an amazing fact. So this is called financialization. Right? Financialization is a consequence of monetary interventionism. And Marxist scholars who are not interested, contrary to Marx and the monetary system, have difficulties understanding this. Right? So it just falls from the sky. It's a new mode. It's a new mutation of the capitalist system that somehow drops out of nothing. It's just there because there's always some progress, there are productive forces that you don't know about. But it is a direct consequence of monetary interventionism. Then uh, we get uh, in, in such a world in which uh, debt grows and uh, spreads wide, uh, in, in such a world in which, which therefore becomes more fragile, and more interdependent in all sectors uh, of the economy, you get various types of anti-fragility behavior. And for example, one uh, 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 very you know, financial uh, uh, anti-fragility behavior is the uh, uh, great increase 
of the exchanges on the so-called derivative markets. I won't go into the detail, but it's very clear, right? The growth of derivative markets, which is works, works like some sort of insurance against price changes of uh, shares and of, uh, of bonds and so on, is directly related to this ever greater uh, debt. Then a phenomenon that is better known for all of, to all of us is the phenomenon of urbanization. Why do people increasingly uh, uh, go to big cities? Why do they prefer to live in cities rather than on the countryside, live and produce in cities? Now, again, right, uh, sociologists, uh, Marxists, and so on, have difficulties grappling uh, with this phenomenon, of course, there is not just one cause, but clearly monetary interventionism is a very important cause because it creates greater fragility, and so people must uh, uh, behave in such a way that they reduce the risk for their own uh, household, and, but also especially for their firm. So they flock to uh, urban centers because for a firm, right, you have a greater pool of suitable suppliers uh, in, in the urban center, you have a greater pool of p potential cu uh, customers, and therefore you reduce the risks related to your uh, current operations. Same thing for a household, right? You, you cannot um, uh, withstand any significant period uh, of, of time, months, uh, years without income because you need to serve huge debt that you've taken out to pay your nice house or your nice apartment, so you need to stay close to fairly reliable labor markets. If you live in a little village outside of the country, there are few employers, you're dependent on just one or two of them. Uh, and if they go bust or they go out of business or the business is, uh, diminishes, well, you, uh, your, your ability to serve your, your debt might be uh, impaired. Right? So therefore, you have a very strong incentive to remain close to urban centers where you have access also to medical infrastructure and so on and so on. Everything that helps you keep going. Then uh, one rather surprising um, uh, consequence that I've discussed in my, my, my German language book is uh, that uh, as a consequence of monetary intervention in a debt economy, architecture tends to become more ugly. Okay, so there's the economics of ugliness. Uh, why is this? Well, um, if we have no debt, right, then in, in you build a house or you set up a house, uh, then, uh, of course, you, because it's a long-term investment that will uh, benefit yourself now, but also future generations of your family, you try to build the house up to the best uh, standards, up to your own taste, which, because you have money, is likely to be more developed than uh, the taste of uh, previous generations of your family that were just peasants and had to live from day to day, so couldn't educate themselves and so on. So you have refined taste and you have nice architecture, uh, original architecture, idiosyncratic architecture, but something some, some, something nice. Now, um, uh, if you are heavily indebted, then of course it becomes very Im Im important for you that your assets, among which are, uh, uh, is real estate, uh, be as liquid as possible. Right? So it becomes important that you be able to sell uh, your house, your apartment, uh, as, as quickly as possible in case there is a financial emergency. Now that means, of course, that if you buy the house or if you build the house, uh, it's no longer your own taste that is primordial, but it's the taste of what you expect to be the average buyer on the market. And so the whole orientation changes. It's no longer the refined taste of uh, people who have uh, education and so on, but it's what's supposed to be the average taste of everybody who's likely to buy this. Right? So things become more standardized, more homogenized, and uh, yeah, in a word, less appealing, shall we say, ugly. And of course, the, to top it all off, the, the worst, of course, as soon as the government gets involved with public housing projects and so on, then I won't go into this. Right? So, uh, a last uh, consequence of this that I might mention is uh, the increasing feminization of the, the workforce. Now, again, there, there are different uh, aspects here, but um, and I'm, uh, it's a little bit more speculative because as an economist, I'm, of course, not uh, particularly qualified to express myself on, uh, as we shall say today, uh, gender differences, right, uh, sex differences. Uh, but I, I'm just talking from my own observation and what I read here and there. So in my own observation, okay, there are differences between the, <laughs> between the sexes, unfortunately so. And uh, one, one big difference is, uh, in which is well discussed in the literature, is uh, risk aversion or risk friendliness, right? So males are typically much more risk friendly 
uh, females tend to be much more risk averse, and this for very good reasons, and which is also then of one reason why males and females tend to fit good together, it might give good couples. Now, so the point is, if you have an economy that is increasingly prone to debt, in which therefore risks increase, right, you, part of your anti-risk behavior is to put risk averse people into leadership positions, among which tend to be more women than males. So again, this is not one, not the only cause, but it's one of the causes that brings about this phenomenon. Finally, Hans, you told me I have five extra minutes, a few words on morals, okay? Now, clearly in, a, in an environment in which money prices constantly increase, there are less incentives uh, to save, right? Of course, uh, no more incentives to save in cash, which has been the traditional the preferred way of saving of low income, low wealth groups, right? So all of these are of course disadvantaged in such an environment, but nobody cares for them except on Sundays uh, when we come out of churches. So they say something nice about the poor, uh, the working poor. Uh, uh, so, so their form of saving is no longer work, so what can they do? Uh, so you can either buy real estate, you can buy financial titles, or you spend more on current consumption. Uh, or a combination of all those. But in any case, we have a greater tendency now for current consumption. So the aggregate level of savings diminishes uh, to the benefit of, of current consumption. Um, so the savings culture is undermined. Um, responsibility, accountability are undermined right? because precisely you have a central bank that backs up all major institutions and that the voting citizens expect to prevent any major recession from happening. So personal responsibility, uh, farsightedness, uh, circumspection uh, in one's decision making is undermined because we all hope that somehow we will be bailed out. Independence is undermined. Right? We, as a matter of fact, we become more interdependent because we become more interdependent, we also have a very perverse incentive to look with an envious or a concerned eye on the activities of our neighbors. Right? If, they go, uh, if a major market participant goes bankrupt, well, this might have repercussions on everybody because the whole pyramid, the whole house of cards of debt might collapse and might affect my, myself. So I have a personal material incentive in asking the government to regulate the other guys so that they don't do any inconsiderate move. So we get this very perverse uh, uh, incentive that, that uh, Torsten Pollitt has uh, called uh, uh, collective corruption. That's correct. And finally, uh, as far as, uh, as, as morals are concerned, it's important to notice that in a, an interventionist system, uh, we get a very strong presence of what economists call rationality traps. That is, uh, people behave in a, a behavior that they themselves would admit is uh, unsuitable from an aggregate point of view, but they do it nevertheless because it uh, suits their own, at least short-term, interests. Uh, an example is uh, the flooding of people into uh, the financial uh, sector, right? So people are looking for employment in the financial sector. From an aggregate point of view, it's clear that uh, this is not beneficial, right? If, if more people are shuffling around money, because by and large that's what you do in the financial sector, uh, rather than be, uh, providing services that you could buy with money, right? So rather than becoming a baker, a shoemaker, uh, somebody who knows something about road, road construction, engineering, and so on, right? So less people have an incentive to do this and more people have an incentive to go into the financial area. Even though they know that from an aggregate point of view, it's, uh, it's not conducive to greater well-being, but for them personally, right, they can place themselves in this way among the winners of the redistribution process that goes on thanks to monetary interventionism. Uh, so it's a typical case of a rationality trap. And these are very wide, very numerous uh, in uh, interventionist uh, economy. Now, rationality traps, as you can imagine, are of course debilitating. Right? So they are discouraging uh, for the, the, the moral orientation of individuals. Right? You uh, say, well, on the one hand, I should be doing this, but I'm really drawn to uh, this other activity. Why doesn't it pay to behave in a moral way? Uh, uh, so I've come to be, got to become a swine, right? And so in order to, to earn my living, whereas I should be doing something, something nicer, and so on. Right? So. We have uh, this debilitating uh, if, uh, effect 
um, and which, of course, uh, is uh, uh, devastating from a moral point of view. Right? If it no morals in the traditional uh, perspective is precisely what helps us to be successful in life. Right? Good morals uh, well should pay the bills not immediately, but in the long run. Right? Good morals are help, uh, help us to lead a successful life, finally, and ultimately to get us in heaven if it's really perfectly done. Right? But in an interventionist system, there's a permanent conflict between what should be done from an overall point of view and what is in your short-term interest to do. Right? And that, of course, and that's the last consequence, is, of course, it can lead to, well, inner conflicts and uh, depressions. Right? So these, again, have many uh, causes. But one are the, the rationality traps that constantly create inner conflicts within uh, individuals. So to make it short, then, the culture of inflation is characterized right, by greater uh, ugliness and greater depressions and various other uh, nasty economic consequences, more than enough to get rid of them. But uh, I cannot give you the full picture, all you need to know and all you want to know about uh, the culture of inflation within uh, almost 40 minutes. So I need to follow up next year or somewhere like this. Thank you very much for your attention.